welcome everyone to this webinar. This webinar is organized by the Center for Autism and Theology. And before I introduce our uh, speaker of today, Dr. Catherine Trifona, let me briefly introduce the center to you. The Center for Autism and Theology was launched in 2018 by Professor Grant McCaskill and some other colleagues in the, Depart in the Department of Divinity and Religious Studies at the University of Aberdeen. The center aims to host interdisciplinary research into autism and theology in relation to theology and church and faith. As such, we hope that the center can function as a hub, bringing together everyone interested academically or not um, in the intersection of autism and theology. And in this way, we hope to contribute to the academic world, but also to be of service to the church and other faith communities. As part of our activities, we organize two webinars per teaching term. So do take a look at our website for other activities uh, that we are doing and how you might get involved with the center. And of course, you can follow us on social media. It's a real pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Catherine Trifona. Catherine is based at Cardiff Metropolitan University, where she is associate Associate Dean for Partnerships with Cardiff School of Technologies. Catherine is a principal lecturer in software engineering, teaching a range of topics, including programming, uh, mobile app development and team project development. Her research centers on the use of technology for the purpose of inclusivity and accessibility. And one of her specific interests, which she will talk about today, is how the use of technology by autistic children in worship settings is perceived in churches and specifically by clergy. The program for today, uh, Catherine will talk for about 45 minutes and after that we will have a short break, a couple of minutes, and then during the break and after that you can type your questions in the chat box and we will have a time of uh, question and answers Q&A. So Catherine, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today and we look forward to what you have to say. The digital floors, the floor is yours. Brilliant. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction, uh, Leon. It's it's a real privilege to be here and to talk to the group today. Um, I've got quite a lot of slides that I'm going to whiz through. Um, and um, as always with these sort of presentations, it's hard to go into a lot of depth um, when it comes to research work, but um, hopefully I can give you a little bit of a flavour uh, for some of the things that I've been doing. Um, as Leon said, one of my roles at the university is that of Associate Dean for Partnerships. So it would be remiss of me if I didn't take this opportunity just to very quickly introduce um, the school to you. Um, so um, we're based in Cardiff uh, Metropolitan University. We are the nearest, newest of five schools we formed in February of 2018. And I'm really lucky with my portfolio that I get to look after a lot of different aspects of the school life, including research and innovation partnerships industrial partnership and some international partnerships as well. Um, and as you can see, we, we, we enjoy some lovely facilities. You can see um, in this bottom right, we've got some students working hard on their code. Um, this picture just above um, is with our Deputy Dean, uh, Dr. Jason Williams, and he is doing a great Chris Tarrant impression there. Um, and he is hosting a game of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Uh, as I mentioned, we work really hard with Welsh government and um, local businesses to, um, I, I think, I suppose, help with the economic priorities of the area. Um, so we work closely with industry, as you can see in this top left hand corner and the bottom one. Um, I don't know if you can see, but that's a group of students. Um, many of them are wearing orange. We enjoy really good links with international universities across Europe. So that day we had students over from Eindhoven and Utrecht and it happened to be King's Day. So they were all wearing orange and, and, and celebrating with us. So we're really, really lucky that we're, although we're a small school, um, we're, we're really active. So um, just to give you a brief uh, overview of the, some of the things I'm going to be talking about today, um, I'm going to firstly explain where this project sits on the computing spectrum because um, some of this comes down to semantics and, and understanding what this sort of technology project looks like. Um, I'm going to give a brief, a very brief introduction into why autism and technology, why this is an important area of research. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what, you know, why I chose this topic and very briefly skim over some of the methods and the methodology. 
Um, and then really what I want to do is spend the bulk of the time focusing on what emerged from the research that I undertook, because I think particularly given the, the people in attendance today, I'm, I'm hoping it, some of it will be of, of some interest to you and it might give some food for thought uh, going forward, including some thoughts about uh, the future. And then, of course, as Leon said earlier, hopefully we'll have some time for some questions uh, after the break. So if there's anything that I say that's of interest, um, please do ask away. Uh, I just want to touch on the use of terminology because, um, I, you know, I know there will be lots of different views on this and I am coming at this, I guess, from the perspective of a technologist rather than a theologian. So some of the language that I use might not be um, how you would prefer me to use it. Um, I tend to try and stick to um, terminology such as uh, autistic person or autistic child and most of my research um, I should mention at this point focuses on the experiences of, of children um, using technology but it could much much of it could equally apply to adults as well. Um, I may occasionally say person with autism um, sometimes that's because that's some of the terminology that I've been used to hearing over the last 20 years uh, of my exposure to this area, but I do try to focus on an autistic person and autistic child because that um, represents a lot of the preferences that we hear from the autism community. Um, I, I try to use the word clerics, um, uh, so that might refer to people who are priests, deacons, ministers and bishops. Depending on which denomination you belong to, you may have your own terminology, but um, it, it, it's a person, I guess, who's in authority that I'm, I'm generally referring to here. Mobile technology is quite, quite a broad um, term. Uh, but in the context of this study, I'm talking about smartphones and tablet computers. Um, of course, mobile technology can include things like smartwatches. It could be things like um, virtual reality headsets, uh, you name it. But that's generally what I'm going to be referring to. And I just want to pause on this one because one thing that you might hear me referring to in my talk is um, problem um, and I think this is probably true of a number of different disciplines, but in technology, problem really um, refers to something that we are trying to address. It's not necessarily something in a negative sense. Um, so if I use that term, it's generally how we refer to something that we are trying to um, improve or assist uh, with technology. It's in no way a reference to the person using it or the organisation within which that it's being used. It really is about helping technology, um, using technology to help make the world a better place, I guess. So I said that I was going to explain a little bit about where this project sits. Um, you've possibly heard um, even if you don't work in technology, you've possibly heard this sort of terminology flying around, you know, a computer scientist, a software engineer, an information systems analyst, and um, wondered what the differences are. And I think this is probably a, a semantics issue that we have, not just in research, but also in industry as well, because sometimes the terminology can get switched about. But really, a computer scientist is somebody who thinks about the theoretical and the mathematical underpinnings of, of computing. Software engineering, um, if you're old enough like me to remember the old Zanussi adverts um, where they talked about um, the appliance of science, a software engineer is somebody who takes that, that theory that's been proven in computer science and uses it to create um, innovative software artifacts. Um, and then you've got an information systems person or an information systems analyst, and that is somebody who um, has a technical understanding of software um, and, and hardware and technology, but looks to understand ways in which it can interact with people, or organisations and society. So from my um, career background, I probably sit um, somewhere in the middle between software engineer and information systems. I've got professional software engineering experience, but I've long had an interest in how technology can help and, and support people. And my project that I'm talking about today sits squarely within that space. It's not really about the technology development per se. It's, it's understanding how people feel about its use. 
Um, and one of the things that I found when I uh, embarked on this research is there is actually quite a quite a gap in the literature and the research uh, when it comes to um, science uh, and and in religious spaces, technology and religious spaces. Um, and I think that there is a hesitancy to tread that line between the two domains. And I think that that's for multiple reasons. Um, one of my background, um, one of my previous roles is teaching astronomy uh, out in the community. And it was always interesting to come across people and talk to them about how um, scientific understanding fits in um, with religious beliefs. But one of my favorite quotes is that of Carl Sagan. Um, and it's that science is not only compatible with spirituality, it is a profound source of spirituality. Um, and um, yeah, so Carl Sagan was uh, a senior scientist with NASA and, and the universities in, in New York. Uh, I suspect many people will have, will have heard of him. So why autism and technology at all? Well, um, autistic children have often shown a strong affinity for technology, um, including mobile technology, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, and, and there's plenty, plenty of literature to, to back that up. And I suspect, um, let's face it, I think a lot of children have a strong affinity for mobile technology, but um, there are numerous um, possible reasons why autistic children in particular gravitate towards digital technology. Different ideas have been put forward that it might be to do with predictability, um, with control, um, with sensory distraction. Um, it is something we are still unpicking, I think, in terms of the research. Uh, but yes, so so we know that they, they are often drawn to technology and same with adults, actually, but we're focusing on children today. One of the uh, attractive things I think about mobile technology is that it is relatively, relatively affordable compared to some of the other supportive technology that's been used in domains such as speech and language therapy. And because, of course, most of us have smartphones um, or tablet computers, um, it's relatively discreet as well. You know, if you take these sort of devices out into the community, um, people aren't necessarily going to know why you're using it. Uh, and that brings many benefits. But as we'll see later in this talk, it actually does also bring about some drawbacks too. Um, they're mobile. They're easy to chuck in a bag. Uh, as a mum, I know I know how, how much of a benefit that can be. Um, but like I said, one of the things that drew me to this project is that this has not really been widely explored, um, how people feel about autistic children using uh, this sort of technology in, um, you know, in, in religious spaces. I'm going to uh, um, give you two minutes to watch a quick video. And this is about robots. And I know that doesn't seem necessarily relevant, but I just want you to watch it for a couple of minutes and just have a little think about how you feel about what you're seeing. I can't ask you because this is a webinar, um, but just just have a look at this video and also pay attention to the little boy towards the last part of this video who is wearing a, a blue T-shirt and, and glasses. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this. What if a developer could help teach a nonverbal child how to communicate with loved ones? What if an animator could bridge a habitual child to an ever evolving community? What if a researcher could implement innovative technology to minimize overstimulation in children and improve learning? What if these people and others from around the world came together on a journey to transform the classroom? Combining talents to shape a better path for special education by allowing children to take their learning to the next level. Opening up a world of possibilities.
help shape the path and become a part of the journey. Um, so I, I suspect you, you guessed from the context of that video that um, the little boy at the end um, is autistic. Uh, th these now robots, as they're called, um, have been used quite extensively in terms of supporting children who are autistic and, and actually also dyslexic. Um, the reason I showed you this is because our interaction with this sort of technology can often bring about quite a strong emotional response. Um, and sometimes that's favourable, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it can be mixed emotions, this idea of sort of seeing a child make friends uh, with that robot. And, and apparently this little boy was very much drawn to the robot, wanted to be his friend and wanted to teach him new things. Um, so it's really interesting. We have these robots in the university and seeing people interact with them for the first time is amazing. Um, because they will crouch down and they will talk to them. Um, I myself, even though I you see them regularly, I will pick them up and carry them on my hip like a small child, or I will put my finger in its hand, or I will talk to it as I'm moving it around, which is ludicrous because it would be like me doing that with my MacBook. It is still a plastic box full of wires, but the presentation of that technology um, does promote an emotional response. And some people might not feel comfortable um, with the idea of an autistic child uh, interacting with that sort of technology. Um, but those robots, and you can see some of the other robots that we have at the university here on this slide, um, they're all kind of cutesy looking. Um, and, and that is by design. All of these robots operate within hospitals, care home settings, or with children, we've used them to help refugee children learn English. And you can see Avine, um, she's the, the, the picture of the, the lady on her own with the laptop. Avine is also using these robots, these now robots to help with speech and language therapy. Um, and the design of them means they are, people are more likely to be welcoming um, as opposed to a robot like say Sophia. Um, Sophia is much more humanoid looking um, and as a result people can sometimes feel a little bit more freaked out for one of a better description or they may be more more suspicious. So the robots that you saw in the previous slide are deliberately um, kept as kind of a cute design um, because that helps them make them more acceptable um, and, and um, they're better for, for accessibility in that sense. So why am I showing you these robots? Um, because it gets you thinking, I think, a little bit about our emotional response to technology. And robotics and technology is developing very, very quickly. And it's understandable if we have mixed feelings about it. Um, so if I bring us back now to the humble mobile phone, uh, compared to the robots, you might be thinking, well, I don't really have um, much of a strong reaction to that. But hopefully as we go through the slides now, we will unpick, unpick that a little bit and maybe sort of have a mutual reflection on how we feel about mobile technology. Some of the ways in which autistic children might be using mobile technology. Um, there's, there's various various ways, um, particularly within um, therapeutic uh, support and, and healthcare and, and even diagnostics. So there's been a number of ways in which um, researchers have tried to support the diagnostic process using mobile technology. And I've got some examples here. Um, this, this, particular, this particular picture here that you can see with like a heat map on it, um, this is from an app um, produced by a company called Harimata, um, which uh, is a Polish company and they work in collaboration with the University of Strathclyde. Um, they look at how uh, an autistic child or any child um, interacts with the tablet. So it's got a number of games on it um, and it looks at things like the child's or the user's motor skills, but also the way they play certain games. And what that does is it gathers data to give some sort of probability that the child might be autistic. So software like this is able to draw on things like machine learning that identifies patterns in users behavior to to pick up evidence uh, that, that you know something might be going on 
Um, and there's another one here called NODA. So NODA um, works with parents and families to capture evidence of autistic behaviours outside of the clinician's office. So this is a US based project. Um, and there's sort of a bi-directional link between the family and, and the, the clinician in, in a healthcare setting. And they can be directed to gather evidence of autistic behaviours by the child. So that might be um, filming them during playtime or it might be filming them uh, at the dinner table. And we all know, I think, that probably uh, getting a diagnosis um, of autism is important. Um, you know, it's it's one of the best prognosis indicators if you can get an early diagnosis, according to the literature, because um, it often not unlocks opportunities for support. But getting there is really challenging. And um, when you take a child to see a, a healthcare professional, sometimes you're getting very much a snapshot uh, of what's going on in a rather unusual environment. Um, it is an evidence based diagnosis. So these um, these software applications are trying to contribute to building that portfolio of evidence to support it. Um, and there's also, like I said, there's the therapeutic application. So there's an example there of PEX, Pixar Exchange Communication um, System. You've possibly seen PEX cards um, that can be used to support um, verbal communication. Um, Generally, the software option is only there for um, people who, who have gained a certain level of proficiency in using PEX. Um, but again, putting them on a tablet device um, helps with mobility, but you can also do things like you can set up contexts. So if a child is in a supermarket, there's a good chance that the tablet or the mobile phone knows that. Um, so it may be that certain PEX cards can be made more readily available um, and more quickly for the user. Um, but I think also one of the most important uses of mobile technology for autistic children and their families is that it is um, a welcome play device, a welcome distraction. Um, and sometimes just having those devices um, with the family can can help their mobility and help them to go out and 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 um, in, enjoy different uh, situations that might otherwise be, be challenging. Uh, there are many autistic families who report that having a mobile phone or a tablet computer can make the difference between you being able to stay in a restaurant um, or a play centre or, or not. Um, so there's lots of potentially really good applications. Um, I'm not going to labour this point, but I, I, I've put this here because I think we probably all <laughs> use mobile technology. I perhaps use it a lot more than many, many people, but mobile technology is something that has become ubiquitous in society. It is something that many of us are depending on on a day to day basis. So coming back to the robots and I was sort of saying about the emotional response, even though I mean, and, and you know, most of us don't have robots um, motoring around our homes on an everyday basis. But mobile technology, we often do. And, um, you know, it might be easy to assume, I think, that we don't have similar emotional responses. Um, but I, I would argue potentially that we do. Um, this is an image I found uh, by an artist called uh, Steve Cutts. Um, you could go on YouTube and have a look at some of um, the videos he's produced. Um, they're, they're very dark, uh, but they're really quite remarkable. Um, and, and mobile technology, I think it's fair to say, can suffer from an image problem. Um, you know, there's you, you often hear words um, being thrown around such as that it dehumanizes us or it turns us into zombies, um, that it's enslavement of, of humanity. And, you know, people like Elon Musk, who I know, which is very, who is very much man at the moment in the news today, uh, but Elon Musk talks about our attachment to mobile technology is effectively turning us into a cyborg. <laughs> I'm not here to debate that, that's above my pay grade, but you can see that actually we tend to have very strong feelings. You know, people talk about taking a digital detox when they go on holiday, when they unplug and they switch everything off. Um, and if you think about how 
how it feels to see people in restaurants, you know, all sat around a table, all on their mobile phones. It's, you know, people can be quite judgmental of that. So given given the image problem, the thing I wanted to think about was, OK, so, you know, what are the themes that shape the acceptance of mobile technology when it's used by autistic children and their families in religious spaces? Um, mobile, uh, sorry, technology acceptance is a very well developed discipline um, within computing uh, and information systems, but in religious contexts, it's really not that well explored. Um, I came across one study of those now robots in the context of Islam, um, but broadly speaking, there wasn't a huge amount besides. Um, so I started all this in the pandemic. <laughs> um, that's where I sort of really got going with it. Um, and the bulk of the data collection that I did was done during the lockdowns, and that's very much shaped how I've approached uh, approached this. Um, I just want to make uh, the point that I haven't knowingly in asked any autistic people in the project. Um, this, my participants are all clerics, um, so there are no known autistic people uh, in the project. I'm not going to bore you with the literature and list it. If you, um, the thesis, I believe, is available online if you want to read it. But just some of the key points in the literature were that, you know, as I've said, autistic children often have a strong affinity for mobile technology. And what was clear from the literature and subsequently the data is that it is quite clear that Christian communities not only want to be inclusive and create that sense of belonging, but they are committed to it. Um, and I think that goes without saying, certainly from you know um, a theological perspective, a philosophical perspective, they want to be inclusive environments. Um, autistic people are spiritual and they want to be included in religious communities and there's again been some really interesting literature in that space um the problem is thinking about the steve cutts image that we just saw um where there is a risk of stigma either real or perceived having children extensively use mobile technology in public spaces risks compounding that stigma um <clears throat> and um, like i said it's very limited in terms of, of the acceptance there are technology acceptance models, but they tend to focus on the organization and the user. Um, and I'm looking at the, um, how people observing the use um, feel. So, so this is a little bit different. So I did this by using something called an interpretive phenomenological approach, which is where shorthand version, you almost become a participant in your own study. I mean, it is about gaining an understanding into the lived experience of, of, of people. So I wanted to gain an understanding of the lived experience of clerics to try to figure out how they felt about this use. One of the reasons I did this, um, you can see this image here on the right. This is actually a picture of um, the bishop laying his hands on my dad's head. My dad is a Roman Catholic priest. Before that, he was an Anglican priest um, and I'm Greek Orthodox uh, officially. So um, I grew up with an understanding of the church as being a cultural organisation, um, an organisation with its own politics and dynamics instead of just you know, a place that I went to go and worship. And therefore, um, I, that would have been pretty hard to remove from myself as a researcher. So this seemed a really good way to incorporate that. I interviewed senior clerics and only a few of them, um, um, and they were all bishops and archbishops. Um, so senior, senior clerics in three different denominations, the Anglican Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and an Eastern Orthodox Church based here in the UK. So this study was confined to the UK. So um, I'm going to go through each of the themes that emerged from the data. So once I did these interviews, I went through the data, the, 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 tra the interviews, I transcripted them, and then I did a thematic analysis. So I looked for key themes that were emerging from each of these interviews. And that's what I'm going to be addressing now. And I'm just keeping an eye on my time just to make sure I don't go too far over. So the first one is inclusivity. Um, so as I mentioned before, it goes without saying that um, the Christian community here in the UK give every indication that inclusion and belonging is really important to them. 
Um, so there was, and, and, and that was backed up not only in the literature, but what was emerging from the interviews with the clerics as well. Um, and, and that's really great because, uh, you know, there is a large Christian community here in the UK um, and that represents uh, a significant opportunity for autistic children and their family to vo forge valuable social contacts. Um, you know, we know the benefits of spiritual and religious expression and, you know, whether somebody is autistic or not, that can be really, really important. But church communities also represent, um, they're like a family. Um, so they're an important source of pastoral and practical support in many cases. You know, if we think about the wonderfully diverse um, community that we have in, here in the UK, and I know this all too well, having been a migrant myself and living in another country, um, that when you have a family, particularly children uh, and potentially autistic children, having that source of support can be really, really important. Um, so I've got here a quote from one of my uh, participants. Um, you know, I think I've mentioned earlier about the theological motivation for inclusion of autistic individuals. Um, and this this was um, one of the quotes that I really liked. And he, Jesus, accepted everyone. And why can't we take that as an example? And we who consider ourselves whole or normal, uh, whatever you want to call us, should look to these others and learn from them. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, again, some, some of the language coming through might not be something, you know, everybody agrees with, but I think there was this sense of openness that was prevalent across all the interviews. Um, and churches, you know, are, are, are complex. I, I remember a quote um, in Grant McCaskill's book, you know, which was that the place where the battle of the flesh and the spirit occurs most violently, and it may therefore continue to be full of dangers for its vulnerable members, is really interesting because the desire for inclusivity and belonging is there, but how it plays out um, doesn't always work that way. Um, COVID-19, as I said, that this research was being undertaken in the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a really interesting time to look at this because um, in effect, we all started to bend on technology in some way for our own inclusion and our own sense of belonging. And that could have been with friends and family. I mean, who remembers quiz nights on Teams or Zoom, um, you know, um, or, or, or trying to attend, attend church services? And it was a... <laughs> When the pandemic started, I thought, oh, no, this ruins everything. But actually, it made it for a really interesting conversation because churches were then reflecting on their own relationship with technology and what it meant to be included. You know, what are the implications of um, making spiritual communion rather than necessarily being in the church? What does this mean for people who have previously been excluded for whatever reason? Um, so there's been some really interesting dialogue and discussion within uh, the Christian community about um, technology and its role in our lives. But I think one of the important things about inclusion is, particularly if it is facilitated by technology, is will we even recognise it when it's there? Um, coming back to that image problem of mobile technology, you know, how many of us have seen groups of young people in restaurants just like that image there and thought, you're not even talking to each other. You're not. Are you even with each other? Why? Why bother? Yeah. Um, you know it, it, that that's sometimes how people feel when they're confronted with that sort of scene. Um, but for those who um, perhaps know autistic people, know it doesn't. It's not necessarily that simple. Um, parallel play. Um, I, I loved. I saw this cartoon um, a, a few weeks ago, and I, I had to check it in this presentation because I just thought it was so great. Um, for many people who know and love autistic people, they will know that parallel play is um, a, a really important feature. And I know that's something, you know, that uh, many people I love really enjoy. Um, but uh, but the optics of it are problematic because it doesn't necessarily look like fellowship. It doesn't necessarily look like community. It can actually look like it's running counter to all of that. So that's something for us to think about. Another really important theme that emerged was the role of clergy. Um, so that image there, and um, some of you might recognise the, the priest in the picture, that's um, Father uh, Jorge Bergoglio, who is now um, Pope Francis. Um, I didn't want to put another one in on my dad. 
hope so. Um, so yeah, so this this was a really interesting thing because obviously I was talking to senior clerics um, and what was evident from the discussion is that the majority of clerics or clergy are really quite comfortable with the use of mobile technology in spiritual domains. Um, so it's it's quite widespread, widely spread in terms of its use. Um, but what was interesting is it seemed to be confined to certain types of events. So things like chapter meetings, um, clergy conferences, um, that sort of thing, rather than necessarily routine services. So if you think about a clergy conference or the bench of bishops or some sort of meeting like that, often the, the clerics there will bring out mobile phones and tablets rather than lugging around huge volumes um, of books. Um, some were saying that they used it for for their daily office, um, but there were some some minor concerns. There was often a hesitancy. I got the impression there was a hesitancy around its adoption at first. Um, but also there is, if you think about those big missiles that I've just mentioned, there is a level of discipline in learning your way around those sort of volumes, those sort of books and navigating your way around them. And some people, especially older clerics, some older clerics, not all, um, there may have been concern around a lack of discipline or that something was being lost by the automated nation, uh, the automated um, in nature of, of, of that kind of use. Um, so why are they more confident in using it? I, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's the short answer. I do wonder if there is a reinforcement. Um, I got the impression that, you know, in these sort of events when one, or, you know, some clerics were using it, then it became more acceptable and then more and more people were using it. But it's not necessarily translating into the services. As it, remember, I had a very limited um, data set. So, you know, in some some churches, this might not be a problem at all. But there seems to be a little bit more of a hesitancy in taking it into services that perhaps involve congregation. So that's just something for us to think about. Um, one of the interesting thing is, given the seniority of the clerics, you know, bishops and archbishops, you might expect that the directives will come down uh, from that level to the per perhaps the parish level, uh, that grassroots level, as I describe it. But that wasn't actually the case. It didn't work out like that at all. Um, there was a consistent message generally that the clerics would be the that the gra of the grassroots level would be the ones who would be providing the education and shaping acceptance um, amongst congregations. Um, some cu cultural uh, variation was observed. So one of, as I said, one of the uh, denominations that I looked at is an ethno-religious group. And, um, you know, so there's, there's something here called power distance. This is um, a model by Kea Trofsted, and I suspect many people will have heard of this. Um, and we can see that in um, Russia and Greece and Egypt, for example, there's a much greater deference to power than there is um, perhaps in, in the UK. So some of that was coming through in the data as well. Um, I won't read out these quotes, but I will leave them up on the screen and perhaps, you know, if you want to have a little look at those. Um, but it, it was evident that, you know, grassroots level change is going to be required. If we think about the different denominations and even within any one denomination, there's going to be huge cultural variation on the ground. So it is clear that the, the clerics at that level, are they're going to be the people who know, they know their, their parish, their group uh, the best and they will be the best place to, to support change. Purpose of use was important. There was a general acceptance. So if I was to say to somebody, oh, you know, you can can an autistic child use a tablet in church? Yeah, no problem. But actually, one of the things that came through was this idea of purpose of use. Why are people using these tablets? So there was a general acceptance, but you could see there was some hesitancy uh, around why somebody might be using it. Um, and when I spoke to clerics, either informally or formally, um, they all said the same thing. It's nobody's business. It's nobody's business why they're using the tablet or the mobile phone. Uh, but quite frankly, I'm not sure that that's enough reassurance uh, for families. Um, so 
you know, when one of the clerics sort of mentioned about, um, you know, the, the, the use should be confined to children, not so much adults, because temptation, and that was the word, temptation might creep in. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down the, to the potential for distraction. Um, another cleric said it doesn't really matter because we're all playing video games in our head when we go to church anyway. Um, you know, uh, uh, going to church and thinking about um, the washing up, um, what you've got to do in work on Monday, whatever it happens to be. Um, so this idea of hidden functionality um, could, you could see there was a potential for that to create some level of anxiety. So one of the things we talked about was this idea of visible authorization of use. Would it help if churches had their own tablets that were issued by them um, so that people had a clear indication that this use was being authorised by the church? So if I was to go to church and use one of these tablets, people would be maybe less likely to judge because I was using a tablet that had clearly been issued um, by the church itself. Individual and community. Uh, was another theme that came up. Um, it, it, I've, I've mentioned this before, but the, the cultural variation um, across the different denominations is quite important, um, I think, you know, for our own identity. Um, you know, we, I think, a lot of people will go to church um, and, and have an expectation of what that's going to look like um, and, and, you know, what they want the environment to be in order to express um, the, their own, uh, to, to, to express themselves spiritually in a way they, they want, but also the, uh, in a way they need. Um, and it was interesting to hear the clerics draw the comparison with being part of a messy family, um, a messy home, you know, for those of us who live with other individuals, we know that we have to kind of accommodate each other um, regardless uh, of who we are. You know, we all have um, we all have our own wants and desires and our own quirks. Um, and that family dynamic is um, imperfect uh, and, and, and it can be messy. And there's a lot of parallels drawn in the data between the home uh, and, um, and, and the church environment. So, so th there's a level, I guess, of of, of tolerance um, that that might be needed. Um, so, I've mentioned also uh, in previous slides about the ethno-religious churches, but again, with ethno-religious churches, there can be, um, you know, there can be a strong need to preserve culture and tradition. Perhaps that might be a little bit stronger in some of those churches because they are also an anchor to home. Um, you know, they are also a cultural reference point as well as a religious one. So the dynamics there in those sort of contexts can be a little bit more uh, complex. Uh, digital versus analog. Um, it's in, this, is, this was really interesting because um, there is a lot of uh, comparison, I think, between digital technology and traditional technology. So if you think about the image of a child at the back of church using a colouring in book and scribbling, um, that it seems a lot more wholesome than a child sat on at the back of church on a tablet, maybe playing Roblox or, or something like that. Um, and um, there was some really interesting stuff that came out at discussion um, in the Church Times during the COVID pandemic um, about the use of tablets instead of um, books in the church. And thinking of and there was sort of terminology that was coming through, like kindleization of the word um, and things like this. But one of my participants was talking about um, telling some people to, oh, you know, because he was asked if a particular book was on Kindle and he said, go and buy the book, get the book, you know, touch the pages, smell the pages. There was something, you know, distinct and perhaps more wholesome for want of a better word uh, when it came to digital versus analog. So, you know, that's something I think a lot of us feel in society. So you can see this image here. Um, from a quill meha, um, where you've got people looking at their screens and then this person who's illuminated and colourful reading an actual analogue book. Um, one of the interesting points 
um, that came across in the data was there was no real clear rationale as to why people felt this way, but it was suggested that it might be an issue of novelty. I mean, let's face it, the book is a form of technology, but it's one that's been around for several hundred years um, and we are now comfortable with its use. But with a Kindle or a tablet, that's really quite novel. And so maybe we're not not yet sure. Um, and this is my last theme. Um, you'll be <laughs> pleased to know, but my um, theological thoughts. So, uh, you know, as I said, I'm not a theologian, so I'm not going to critique um, the, the theology, but I do. It is inevitable when you're doing a study like this um, that theological thought will creep into it because you're, you're, you're considering the, the ontological framework of the Christian community to try and understand why technology is accepted. And I found personally that theological thought permeated the whole study. But what was interesting is the way it emerged in the data. It kind of informed and motivated the other themes, things like it motivated inclusion and acceptance. It informed the behaviours of the clerics. Um, you know, it may have informed uh, the behaviours of the congregation. But the theology of technology itself was not a huge feature in the data itself. Um, and what I took from that is that actually a lot of the theological thought about the actual um, Sorry, a lot of the thoughts about the actual use of the technology in churches were not really about the theology of the artefact, but it was about our societal perceptions. Because I think when we come into churches, you know, we come in as a human and, and we bring in some of those societal perceptions and, um, and baggage. Um, so. What was interesting, and, and, and this is um, probably one area where, where perhaps theology was a little bit more explicit is I shared a quote by um, Bishop Callistos Ware, who is um, an Orthodox bishop. He passed away uh, very recently um, and he said our human task as craftsmen or manufacturers is to discern this logos dwelling in each thing and to remend, render it manifest. We speak, seek not to dominate, but to cooperate. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not going to get into the Christology of, of the Logos because, again, that's above my pay grade. Um, but what was lovely is one of the quotes I got back and I'm going to read it to you. Um, it's if what you are doing. Oh, so context. Sorry, um, I asked this. I shared this quote because I wanted to understand as a software engineer, if there was anything I could be doing better to help this technology be accepted. And one of my participants said, if what you are doing in any kind of craft or creative activity is looking for the logos element, it's, um, it's not just something self-contained. It's something that flows into the life of other things and makes everything more itself by connecting, by communion. So I guess if you're trying to apply what Callistos is saying in this context, you'd want to say, so how does this kind of technology actually facilitate real communion between people? And how does it facilitate a just and constructive attitude to the rest of the physical environment and so on? So, you know, you could look at the whole question of technological solutions in the environmental movement. It's not that technology is the enemy. It's just that you have to discover a technology that works for and not against ecological balance. So I think, um, you know, of, even on a relatively superficial level, of, as a, from a technologi technologist perspective, it's like, to what extent do I need to design technology that is going to be culturally con um, sensitive? So in this case, to the autism community um, and the logos, you know, what does its role in true communion uh, actually look like. Um, and that is, um, you know, something that requires a great deal of consideration. And I think that would be squarely um, not just my discipline, but probably the disciplines of, of theology as well. So there's lots of scope for interdisciplinary discussion, uh, I think, there. But it shows something that I think demands quite careful consideration. Um, and it was interesting that the participant talked about uh, the environmental um, movement um, and they went on to sort of compare it technology with the windmill, um, which, of course, uh, we see with Heidegger. Um, and another concept that Heidegger talks about is poiesis. 
um, which is bringing forth the potential for something. Um, so maybe these tablets and these smartphones um, can play a role in you know, what I describe as the poesis of fellowship. It's not that the spirituality and the potential for fellowship of the autistic individual um, has ever not been there, but maybe that this technology can be a vehicle to help um, to help that. The challenge then is, of course, will we recognise it, as I mentioned earlier. So we have um, this, I'm sure you've seen variations on this cartoon numerous times, um, and this one's been updated with the vaccine. Um, but given the hidden functionality and the, the somewhat confusing optics, um, will we know, will we, you know, is, is this, and again, this is something for theologians to think about, um, you know, will we recognise it as the help that we maybe want, um, or, you know, are we going to fall prey, I guess, to um, the difficulty with the optics? You know, are we going to be closed off to these opportunities because we, we're worried about that? And so what's next? This is uh, my final slide. Um, so those were the themes. It's very superficial because it is exploratory at this stage. There's clearly so much work to be done. Um, this is just a very, very tiny piece of a, a much bigger puzzle that remains to be solved. And I think it requires, um, as I said, a, you know, an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary effort to to address it. The conversation is far from over. One of the things I, I can tell you as a technologist is that our domain changes weekly. Um, there's always new developments. Elon Musk, who again has been in the news, um, talks about developing a, a chip for the brain um, to, to help with certain conditions. Does he mean autism? Who knows? Um, would we want that kind of technology? Uh, probably not. But, um, you know, again, Elon Musk is an autistic individual and it's interesting that he is coming out with ideas like that and quite possibly has the means. So it raises um, significant ethical concerns. Developing, developments in technology always do. And um, yeah, so I think we have to be vigilant as a community to these changes because they're coming in uh, thick and fast. So for theology, there is um, a long conversation uh, ahead, I think. And I believe that we are now at the point where we take a short break. <laughs> Catherine, thank you so much for a fascinating, um, well, can I say conversation started then because you made clear that the conversation is uh, far from over and I take that as an invitation to do interdisciplinary research indeed. Um, so great invitation to the theologians amongst us, but also the technologists, I think, and, and anyone else, uh, because what you've demonstrated is that technology is all around us and whether we like it or not, um, it is also part of what it means to be a church community. And, and I think you've um, really challenged us to think about the acceptance of technology by autistic people in the church. So thank you so much for, um, for this overview of, of your research, which is also a great introduction to this topic. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, as Catherine said, we will have a break, but before we have a break, I'm going to hand over to Hannah, who will um, uh, moderate the discussion after the break. Anna Kundil is uh, one of our PhD students and uh, affiliated with the Center for Autism and Theology as well. Anna, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, just to give a few instructions for those of you who want to ask questions of Catherine, you'll see there's a Q&A uh, function on your screen. As you type the question in, it will it will seem to disappear. It hasn't. It's come through just for uh, moderators behind the scenes. Uh, to check it through for anything that can't be made public so just be patient and it will then appear if you see a question that somebody else has asked in the list that particularly interests you you can give it a thumbs up and that will boost it up the priority order so we'll make sure that Catherine gets to answer the the most pressing questions there's a little checkbox which allows you to ask a question anonymously um, that's up to you whether you choose to use that box or not we will try not to say people's names and things out loud as we ask the questions and respond to them because this is being recorded um, for use on YouTube afterwards and on the CAT website. Um, 
so it's up to you to whether you want to be anonymous or not but we will try not to use your names as we ask the questions or the names of anybody you've included um, and other than that I think those are all the instructions so I guess we'll take a break until just after 5 p.m and then it will be an opportunity to hear Catherine's response to your questions hi welcome back everyone so just to say if you have any questions for Catherine you can put them in the Q&A now and we'll have an opportunity to ask them of her. So I think as we're just waiting for some questions to come in, I might sneak my question in first, if that's all right with you, Catherine. Um, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about, you know, when technology is being used in a service uh, or during an act of worship, it sounds to me like most of your um, participants were talking about it being used as a distraction or as a way of keeping young people occupied. Um, was there any talk about using it didactically, you know, maybe having an interactive liturgy or something or liturgy presented as a computer game or something like that, you know, to enable participation rather than distraction? Or can you see any scope for that? Can you hear me OK? Yes. Yeah, bro. OK, uh, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. I think it was, I mean, it, it was used, I think it was viewed primarily as, as a distraction tool. Um, one participant interestingly said, oh, you know, well, if you come into the church with this device, um, we'll start with you from there and see where we go. And that, that you know, that very, you know, we'll start with you from there and it's like, start from where you know I think that indicated that it was seen as 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 a prop or a crux to get somebody into the church and then maybe migrate to not having it or or, or whatever it's hard to know without sort of following up but I think I think that's indicative of the fact that it was seen as a distraction and a tool um, to support them in that environment um, it, that yes there was there was some discussion around the potential use of these devices to um, support children during the liturgy or, or, or perhaps during Sunday school environments as well. Um, so one denomination in particular was a bit quite keen and focused on that. Well, actually two of them. So, yeah. Super, thanks for that. Um, and I, I know that Leon has a question he wants to ask you, so we'll maybe go to Leon just now. Thank you, Anna. Um, yeah. Um, one of your participants, I think, said um, about the use of, of technology. Uh, it, it's nobody, it's nobody's business what I'm doing on my phone or or a tablet or something like that. And um, it just struck me that that's not a great theological statement. Um, and and so I, I just wondered whether you could reflect on that a little bit, um, because I, I okay, you've said you're not a theologian, but you did this this uh, research in the context of worship communities and. I'm I'm not entirely sure what it says about community when you say when when everyone is doing something different on their on their devices or and, and maybe even that is acceptable uh, from from autistic perspective or or I mean from the perspective of, of including uh, or or making sure that everyone belongs in the church but from a theological perspective I I wonder about that statement and, mm. and I wonder if it, it was it one of your participants who, who literally said that or, or yeah I, I wanted to hear um, I want to hear a little bit more if that's okay yeah of course um, so all of my participants said that in, a, in effect in different ways um, and and also clerics that I talked to about my research anecdotally outside of my um, set of participants I, you know, obviously it's, it's, it would be difficult for me to unpick the theology of that. But what I would say is I got the overwhelming impression from everybody who has said that, that it is said with good intentions. It's kind of like people shouldn't be judging what other people are doing in in the church. You know, we we all come as individuals, you know, and I think I think it was done with the sense of welcoming behind it. Everybody is welcome. It's nobody's business. They shouldn't be judging what other people are doing within the church. You know, I guess, and you know, I'm, I'm perhaps speaking for them here, but it's almost that that sense if people should just concentrate on themselves and what they're doing and, and while they're there. Um, 
again not negating the sense of community because I, I think I think there's a duality to it isn't it when we come to church you know we are part of a community a community but we are also very much there as individuals and that desire for that particular aesthetic um, sometimes that can be selfish but sometimes it can be it can stem from a need I need the church to be quiet I need it to look a particular way I'm coming here with a particularly um, pressing issue and I just need it to be a certain way so again coming back to my original point there is that over sent overarching sense of welcome and I think that's where that comment stems from it's people should be welcoming they shouldn't be judging I think that's where it comes from But it's interesting because almost every cleric I have spoken to, either as part of the study or outside of it, has said the same thing. <laughs> it's nobody's business. Sorry for the delay there, Catherine. Something oh, no, up no, on my no. screen that wouldn't let me <laughs> unmute my microphone. Um, so we've had a question come in saying, to, thanking you for your presentation. Regarding your point that science forward slash technology is spiritual, with which I would agree, says the questioner. Is the disagreement surrounding the use of technology because culturally we assume technology is morally neutral rather than seeing it as formational, either for good or bad? For example, research shows that books and literacy have profoundly changed our physiology. Has any of your participants raised the question of how mobile tech shapes us spiritually either for good or bad? Um, that, that's, a re that's a really good point. And, and, and no, not explicitly. And, and I think coming back to my point, there wasn't a lot about the theology of the technology itself. Um, which, you know, which is a, dis a distinct discipline in its own right. Um, you know, I spoke to um, a theologian in St. Melitus Theological College, I think it's called, called Matthew Pryor, who looks at mobile technology in in religious contexts. Um, that that sort of thought, those sort of thoughts were not really not really expressed. Um, there was. There was one comment about. Distraction and um, looking for salvation in the wrong place, looking for salvation um, in the technology instead of instead of God. Um, in terms of the m moral neutrality, I think it comes back to yes. I mean, all three participants gave the general impression that they felt felt that the mobile technology was not inherently good or bad but it was the potential for how it would be used that could be problematic um, so one participant compared it to money money in itself is not inherently good or bad but it, it's it's how you deal with it um, so so it's a really good point about moral neutrality and and um, you know that did feature but i don't i wouldn't have said it was sort of deeply theologically explored in the in the discussions or dialogue right we have a, a second question along a similar line actually um someone saying i appreciated what you had to say about technology being used to aid in worship with the intent behind the creation of some technologies there is the tendency towards distraction and isolation uh, so maybe something, you know, less neutral there. And the questioner says, I think of the recent issues in the United States over Facebook and Instagram. Uh, presumably that's contributing towards distraction and isolation. Can you speak a little more to the proper use of technology to aid connection um, and worship? And how could technology creators think differently about creating future technologies towards that end? It's a good question. Um, I think, again, societally, you know, we, we look at mobile technology in a particular way. So if I'm on my phone, um, I might actually be working or I might be, you know, doing any number of noble things with my phone. But equally, I could be looking at Instagram, Facebook and, and, and whiling away the hours, although they're not, I won't argue that it's not always inherently bad anyway. Um, 
I think the challenge that we have comes down to the optics again. And I think particularly with autism, because engagement isn't necessarily going to look like how we expect it to. So if um, an autistic child is playing a Candy Crush or Roblox or whatever in the church, it would be wrong to assume that they're not engaging in the liturgy. I mean, it might be that that is providing some level of support, sensory distraction, whatever it happens to be. Every autistic person is different. Um, but I think it would be very easy to make the assumption that they are distracted. They may be looking at Instagram photos, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's not the very thing that is keeping them emotionally, spiritually and mentally hooked into what's going on around them. Whereas if you take the, that away um, and you ask them to sit there and sit quietly or look at a book, their brain might be elsewhere anyway. So, I, I, you know, I think I think I think there's always that element to consider in terms of going forward in the developments in technology. That's probably not a question I can easily answer, but I think that, you know, if there's further interdisciplinary work in this space, greater conversation between technologists and um, and theologians, I think confidence will grow um, and, and, and the way that that technology could be developed could look any number of different ways. But I, I think it requires much deeper dialogue before I can sort of say this is the, 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 the direction it should be going. It needs to be informed by those who will benefit. So talking to autistic individuals, getting the engagement of autistic in individuals and asking them what they need and what they want and what helps, but also having a better understanding um, of, of theology so that confidence can grow. I think, you know, like I said, it wasn't the theology of technology didn't come into the conversations much. But if people had a greater awareness of the theology of technology, maybe confidence of use will grow in religious contexts. That's great. And interesting that you mentioned about how, you know, anything going forward needs to um, be informed by the voices of those that would benefit, you know, listen to the autistic voice, mm -hmm. because the next question is sort of along those lines. It, it says you mentioned that you had no autistic clergy participate. And I'm curious if that was because you were unable to identify any autistic clergy or did they elect not to participate? And do you think they would see the use of technology differently? Great. It's a great question and it's one that I have pondered on. Short answer, as I mentioned, I don't know if any of my participants were autistic or not. Um, and um, I'm not sure. Yeah. If 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 they if they were autistic, might they see the use of technology differently? Um, absolutely. But um, how can I word this? Uh, I, I I wouldn't make the assumption that they would. Um, first of all, people can be autistic and not know. Um, and um, just because somebody is autistic doesn't mean they have not grown um, and shaped their views of the world based on the cultural context within which they've grown up or they work or they operate. Um, so I I don't know if any of my participants were autistic. Um, they may well have been. Um, so there was there was no I did not seek to engage specifically autistic clerics. I wanted to get the views of clerics, whether they were autistic or not. Uh, I think is the short answer. Um, whether their views would have changed, I, I don't know. I, I, I suspect with some autistic clerics it would, but not all of them. I, I would guess it probably wouldn't with all of them. I am a person who works in technology. I understand the benefits of mobile technology used for autistic children. Um, I'm when I go to church, um, I might use the Universalis app, which is a Roman Catholic app that brings up all the readings. I feel really uncomfortable doing that, even though it's my area, which is crazy. But it just goes to show that societal baggage um, can still form an important part of our views on things. So like rubbish answer, I know, but th th there's no firm answer on that one, I don't think. No, I think that's fair. Yeah, you may find quite a lot of diversity of opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. In, in or out of the autistic community. Yeah. Um, sticking with this idea then of the diversity of opinion, um, I'm a bit curious to know because you, you mentioned very briefly that there was sort of differences between denominations mm -hmm. that you observed. So I'd love to hear a little bit more um, about what 
those differences were and whether you actually either formally as part of the research or just informally because people now know that you're interested in this have you talked to uh, clerics from non-liturgical denominations you know from the sort of free churches and evangelical churches and so on um, whether they perceive things any differently I tried um, but engagement was difficult I think principally because of the time that we were going through um, I don't think it was that the people I approached didn't think the research was important. I was very fortunate to get the kind of participants that I did, but people had priorities elsewhere, which was looking after people during the pandemic. Um, and this was summer of 2020. Um, so there was a lot going on, I think, for everybody. Um, so in terms of the differences between the denominations that I did look at, which was Anglican, Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, um, there were some cultural differences, uh, not so much between the Anglican and Roman Catholic Church, um, because um, they, they were quite similar in that they're sort of UK based churches with the ethno religious churches. So the Eastern Orthodox, you do see more cultural variation. So things like deference to clergy, um, views on traditions, um, views on language use, things like that, because, as I mentioned in the presentation, they're quite important to the people who are attending. So um, I don't want to say there's necessarily resistance to change because actually the Eastern Orthodox churches are quite interested in technology and how it can be deployed. But um, there is a it's interesting because there's a greater deference to clerics and their authority. But the the preservation of culture on the ground can sometimes, depending on the group, can sometimes win out. And um, I'm going to see if I can remember the quote that I heard that um, we are cultural about our religion but we are religious about our culture. And I think that, you know, if, if I'm a high church Anglican compared to going to another Anglican church where it's like PowerPoint lyrics and a guitar, so, you know, the two, you know, you, you might be part of the same denomination, but those, that culture and that practice is part of my identity as a Christian, as part of who I am. And that, you know, so I think there is, there is a sense of preservation and that comes across slightly more strongly in the ethno religious um, denominations. You know, if it's Greek or Russian or Coptic, you may sort of see those ethnic cultural values coming through a little bit more strongly. Um, hence, in the Anglican and Roman Catholic Church, you don't see such a great distinction because honestly, um, a lot of it comes down to UK based um, culture. Um, you know, that that wins out. <laughs> Great. Um, so there's one more question here and then we might be um, drawing towards an end if there's no more questions coming in from the floor. But I think we were all a bit enchanted by the cute robots at the beginning. Uh, so we have to ask a question about those. Um, you mentioned robots at the beginning. Do you see potential for these to be used in churches? I think this has already been done in the Catholic Church, but you'll know more about this than me, possibly, Catherine. Um yeah, I, I think there is potential. I mean, if you think of Lucas, that little boy in the video, you know, he was he was very strongly attached and it gave him a talking point with the other children. You know, it was a he could use it almost like to support his social interaction. Um, and that that's really useful. Those robots are very uh, are very cute. Um, I did bring one home. Um, my kids weren't interested in it. It basically scared my cat for most of the pandemic. Um, but they could be used in churches. A, Again, I think it depends on the tradition that you're looking at. So one of the few studies on technology acceptance supporting autistic children in religious settings was based on this now robot. And it was using um, it was st a study in Malaysia, I think it was within the context of Islam. The issue with the now robot is it is anthropomorphic. It is a very cute version of an anthropomorphic robot, but that was seen as potentially um, idolatry. Um, so there was a hesitancy to accept it in that context. We may not have the same problem in um, Christian churches, particularly in the UK, which is what I was studying. But I think it, I think it depends on, on the tradition that you're, you're looking at as to how readily they would be expect, uh, accepted. Compared to mobile technology, um, I would say that 
one of the ways that the robots might win out over mobile technology is it's less isolating. It can engage with the community more, whereas if you are using a phone or a tablet, you're kind of you're immediately more shut off. You know, I'm sort of ignoring you. Um, that, that sort of thing. Um, so, so I think there is, I think there is scope um, for these robots. That, um, but you know, I think a lot more work needs to be done on understanding how they're going to be received. Catherine, again, you end with an invitation to do much more research, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. <laughs> um, and, and I look forward to see what's going to, to um, appear over the next couple of years in terms of that research. And, and I'm sure we will hear more from you in that regard, or at least that's what I hope. Um, thank you so much again for, uh, for this fascinating presentation, this fascinating topic, uh, something that we don't well, most of us, I guess, uh, don't uh, think about it on a regular basis, but this is so important. And and, and I, I do think that you, you've you confronted us a little bit with the optics in, in particular of, of the technology, and uh, at least you have made me think about that again. And um, so thank you so much uh, for oh, for you. your answers to the questions for the presentation. It's, it's, it's been wonderful to have you with us for this webinar. Um, and yeah, we look forward to hear more. Thank you also to Hannah for moderating the discussion and for Zoe and Ian behind the scenes who've done a lot of work uh, to make this happen. Thank you all who attended this uh, webinar and we look forward to the next one. And I can already say that probably the next one or one of the next webinars will actually involve um, autistic clergy. So we had a little discussion on that. It's not necessarily going to be about technology, but we are going to hear from clergy who identify it as autistic and what that means for their ministry uh, in, in faith communities and churches in particular. So uh, watch this space. Uh, we will announce this on our social media. Do subscribe to the newsletter uh, to keep up to date uh, so you are sure to get the announcements of that webinar. Thank you all so much and see you again. <laughs>